Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Daily Bay Refuel, where we cap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Dan Lizasano, and it's the 28th of October, 2024. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So once again, I have to apologize for being a little bit AWOL over the last few days. I plan to actually do an episode on Saturday or Sunday, but it just didn't happen because I've had a bit of a cough for the last few days and it kind of uh, turned into, I think, a little bit of a cold that's kind of drained my energy. I am kind of on the mend right now, uh, but we're going to see how we go over the next few days. But I figured I didn't want to keep you guys waiting any longer because I hadn't done an episode in, I think, a week or something now. Um, so yeah, and there's a lot to talk about, actually, a ton to talk about. And as you guys know, I'm headed to DevCon in like less than a couple of weeks as well. So there won't be any refills during that, but I'll talk about that uh, more at the end. Uh, but kicking off today, we have a little bit of a Vitalik tweet thread here that I wanted to talk about briefly. Now, as you guys know, the Ethereum Foundation has come under fire for not just like, I guess, the last few months, but like years about what it's actually spending its money on, right? Like, as you guys know, the Ethereum Foundation is funded via the ETH that they sell that they originally allocated um, to themselves at time of, I guess, creation of ETH and, and the time of mainnet for Ethereum, because that was part of the ICO. Uh, now, the, I believe they have like a few hundred thousand ETH left or something like that, and they sell a chunk, about a hundred million dollars worth uh, a year in order to fund operations. Now, of course, people take issue with this because there hasn't traditionally been that much transparency around it. There's been one transparency report, I believe, for 2022, and there hasn't been one for 2023 yet, which I believe is coming out soon though. Uh, and obviously 2024 is not over yet, so there's not one for 2024. But Vitalik put together this kind of uh, this mini tweet thread basically saying, well, the Ethereum Foundation isn't just cashing this money out to go buy Lambos. It's using it for a lot of different things within the ecosystem. And chief of those is that uh, paying researchers and developers that work at the Ethereum Foundation or I guess closely with the Ethereum Foundation or just giving grants to um, you know, researchers and developers and, and, and other people in the ecosystem uh, via the ETH, uh, the ETH that they sell out of their treasury. And Vitalik basically uh, noted here what this has actually led to over the years. So Ethereum hasn't been bleeding 5 million ETH a year to proof of work because we're now on proof of stake. And as you guys know, m moving from proof of work to proof of, proof of stake uh, reduced the ETH issuance by about 90%. Uh, the fees are lower today. Uh, and I, I think like when he says this, he means on on layer twos because the Ethereum Foundation is responsible for obviously a lot of the layer two uh, efforts uh, and funding them and and also just kind of like helping them, but also getting blobs over the line, right? Uh, and your transactions getting included in less than 30 seconds instead of like one to 30 minutes uh, because of EIP 1559. And this is on the layer one. I don't know how many of you were uh, transacting on Ethereum layer one before 1559 went in, but it was not pretty. Whenever there was kind of demand spikes and stuff like that, transactions would get stuck. It'd be a mess. Like, especially I remember in 2017 during the ICO craze, it was an absolute mess. Like transactions would get stuck for a long, long time. So 1559 fixed that as well as obviously burning the, the fees. Um, but there's that there. And then he continued by saying um, the other stuff that the Ethereum Foundation has helped uh, build and fund uh, is ZK, uh, Zero Knowledge Tech. Obviously, that's, that's been a big part of the EF uh, funding efforts for a very long time. Uh, account abstraction, that's uh, not live yet on the network, but it live in some other ways um, when it's going live. Uh, local ETH events worldwide, including many that barely mention their foundation's name. Um, and Ethereum having zero downtime uh, for, since 2016 from DOS attacks and consensus failures, various security work uh, and libraries and all the codes that you use for wallets, DeFi apps, etc. So yeah, the Ethereum Foundation, obviously for anyone, I mean, with half a brain cell knows that they've done a lot for Ethereum over the years. Um, and they've actually distributed a lot of that power out as well, because as you guys know, and we're just talking about core Ethereum work, there are 10 client teams, right? Like on the consensus layer side and the execution layer side. And the Ethereum Foundation only has one that they uh, incubate in-house, or I guess like that's part of the Ethereum Foundation, and that's the Go Ethereum or Geth team. The rest of them are independent. Now, of course, the Ethereum Foundation helps them with funding and, and has helped them with uh, things like that. Um, ETH, uh, giving them ETH to spin up validators in order to earn rewards, uh, kind of a program that they ran. I guess, guess they've been running it for a couple of years now, but essentially that is a big thing that the Ethereum Foundation has uh, has been doing here. So I think Vitalik, uh, you know, he kind of ended these tweets off by saying, uh, show some respect. I think he got pretty annoyed because who he was replying to was some guy who said, uh, I mean, I have this, this 
account blocked, but like someone said, just stop, stop dumping um, and we'll be all right, bro. And then Vitalik's like, I haven't sold a single ETH in the past month. The amount of ETH I hold has actually gone up. And then this other account asked, and what about the Ethereum Foundation? And then Vitalik's like, oh my God, like stop. You know, we've already answered this question a million times. It's pretty obvious what the Ethereum Foundation uses the ETH for. Uh, but yeah, you, there's always these troll accounts on Twitter. And I think Vitalik finally got to the point where he's like, you know what? Like, screw these guys. Uh, I, I'm going to like, I don't know, enter some kind of like war mode and go against these guys. Uh, not in a mean way, uh, but essentially saying like, sit down. Like you got no idea what you're talking about. So I, I was actually happy to see Vitalik kind of do that because as you guys know, I'm one of the people that do that as well. Like I basically will try to fight this FUD on Twitter and I, I don't take shit either. Like I'm not gonna sit there and, and, and kind of, I guess, massage the message. I'll tell you, be like, hey man, like you're being an idiot basically. Like this is the way it is. If you're gonna keep being ignorant to this, then that's on you. And I won't do it to people who are genuinely asking questions. It's more the, the there's a lot of people out there who know better, but just like like to stir the pot or like to troll, or like to be assholes about things and spread FUD. I don't have any patience for those people. I'll literally tell them to their face. But like you're fighting ETH, fighting Ethereum, you're spreading absolute bullshit and this is why sort of thing. So I, I'm glad for Vitalik did a little bit of that uh, there. But enough on that topic, moving on to the next thing, which was Vitalik quote tweeting uh, someone from A16, uh, Noah, I should say, from A16's, uh, A16Z Crypto here, uh, talking about Helios. Now, Helios is a uh, light client for Ethereum, but it is now becoming a multi-chain light client. So it will also be able to do a layer, layer twos on Ethereum as well. And Vitalik, um, essentially TLDR this and gave some next steps. He said, Helios or alternatives should be integrated into user wallets on mobile and desktop. The layer two configs are moving on chain and layer two config, configs, including specification of state proof verification rules. And uh, he links to kind of possible starting points here. Once those three are done, we get universal L1 and L2 light client verification. Um, and this was the tweet that, uh, I mean, I just covered about the, uh, the person asking him to stop dumping ETH, bro. Like that was on this tweet. Tweet. And I think that's why Vitalik also got annoyed is like he's tweeting about something completely unrelated to price and, mar and the markets and something that he's genuinely excited about when it comes to uh, when it comes to the actual technology and people are just trolling him with these with these comments basically but enough on that uh, I'm super excited about light clients as well as you guys know light clients are kind of like the holy grail for verification of uh, Ethereum and of the layer twos because it essentially means you get to have a full node without having to download a full node well I shouldn't I wouldn't say you get a full node what you get is like the same guarantees like you get to basically verify the chain and verify the, um, the, the chain without relying on any kind of third parties and be able to relay your transactions um, via that instead of going like a third, uh, going via a third party like Infura or something like that. So it's much better for user verification. And it's also uh, getting us closer to the world that that is envisioned that we have like really beefy kind of block builders but very cheap verification. Now, what I mean by this is essentially all of the people that will be building blocks for layer ones and layer twos in the future will be running these really beefy machines that, uh, you know, in data centers or like things that just require a ridiculous amount of uh, of bandwidth, uh, especially at layer twos. But, but the thing is, is that that doesn't matter I mean, it doesn't matter in terms of a verification if we can verify these things via light clients because it means you don't have to run the beefy hardware yourself in order to verify this stuff. Where it does matter is things like censorship resistance and liveness because if there's only one, let's just say there's one builder, like on one of these layer twos, let's say there's only one builder. I mean, a lot of them only have one builder right now, but let's say in the future they you know, they say they're decentralized, anyone can be a builder, but let's say that like one builder is responsible for pretty much like everything happening on the network. That means that that builder has control over everything. Everything, essentially and they can censor if they want to um, and they I mean they can censor you at the L2 obviously a properly constructed L2 will be able to escape patch out to the L1, but that's still not ideal for them to be able to censor there. And then liveness as well. Those kind of go hand in hand where essentially liveness just means that the builder refuses to build blocks and then the blocks aren't being built anymore. The network is technically offline. It's the same as censorship because you're basically being, um, it, it, for all intents and purposes, you're basically being censored in, in both scenarios. So that's, that's a big thing there. And that's why we want cheaper verification in order to verify if this thing is happening as well. But also with um, with these builders, we want to make it so anyone can be a builder. So it, it, we don't need like thousands of these builders, like having 10, for example, or something, or having as many as we can is obviously much better than having one because it gives you better guarantees there. But then the cool thing about L2s is that, as I said, you have that escape hatch option as well. You don't have to essentially be uh, a prisoner to this, I guess, like one builder. If they're censoring you, if, if the network, if the, if the layer two network goes offline uh, for whatever reason, you can go to the L1 
as your escape hatch and your assets uh, should be fine there. Obviously, there are a lot of other in intricacies that go into that, such as where are the assets, um, where are the assets uh, issued on, uh, where they uh, where, where they kind of began. Like, did they begin at layer two or layer one? Can they be mapped? You know, what assets are they? Obviously, centralized stable coins can easily just be replaced because they're just IOUs. For example, if there's like 10 billion USDC on a L2, that L2 goes offline. Well, it's not like everyone loses their 10,000 USDC. Uh, sorry, not everyone loses their USDC. Essentially, what Circle would do is be like, okay, well, that USDC is now invalid. We're going to redistribute um, the USDC to all of the um, accounts that owned it because it's, it's the same Ethereum address across the L1 and the L2, and you'll have your USDC on, on L1, essentially. And yes, you're probably going to pay more fees, but you don't lose everything because that's a centralized asset. Whereas with ETH, it's a different story. If there is no escape hatch, your ETH is essentially or can essentially be locked in that, um, in that bridge that you basically put your ETH into on L1 to go to L2, and then no one's giving you your ETH back because ETH is issued on the Ethereum L1. It's not an IOU. ETH is a is a native asset. It's not like there's something backing that ETH in a um, in a bank account, right? In the real world, ETH is settled ultimately settled on the Ethereum network and, and only exists on there on layer one. So the same is true for like any chain that you bridge to. If that bridge gets frozen for whatever reason, you're never getting that ETH back because that IOU that you have on the bridge to chain is essentially worthless because there's nothing backing it, right? So got to be careful with this, a lot of intricacies, but moving towards a world where we can have light clients in phones and anyone around the world, wherever you are, can verify the chain without having to download a full node is the holy grail. And it's not just the holy grail for verification purposes, and for making sure that you're not getting screwed over. It's the holy grail for scalability of L1 as well, because you can imagine a world where, well, if you get the same guarantees and you don't need to, um, you don't essentially need to download a full node, you can essentially make full node requirements uh, higher and higher. So you can raise the gas limit and you can scale the L1 more. So this is the ideal world we want to be in. And that's why this is so exciting as well, is that if we get to this world where we have this client verification, we essentially get to scale the L1 a lot from here. Like I'm talking orders of magnitude, guys, which is super exciting, of course. And But we get to do that without losing the properties of the L1, the decentralization, the credible neutrality, censorship resistance, so on and so forth, right? So that's that's super exciting there. But enough on that. You can go read more if you want to. I'll link that tweet in the YouTube description below for you to do so. All right, so Vitalik has been putting out a bunch of blog posts recently about the various Ethereum roadmap stages that you all know as the merge, the surge, the scourge, the verge, and the purge. Now, uh, uh, you've you've probably heard of these a million times before. There's no need for me to go through each of them. But Suhail here actually uh, did a TLDR tweet on Vitalik's blog post, which I highly recommend giving a read. So Vitalik did a blog post for each of these things, as you guys have probably seen. But uh, what Suhail's done is just put together a few points about what... Uh, uh, each kind of, I guess, like uh, phase uh, or what, like each part of the roadmap actually aims to do, which is super useful because you can just basically bookmark this tweet. And if anyone kind of asks you, hey, like, when are we going to scale the L1? Or when are we doing kind of quantum stuff for the L1 of Ethereum? Or what are we doing about like state expiry? Or what, what are we doing about like full node sizes? Stuff like that, like the very techie stuff. But you can just refer back to this this TLDR from Suhail, and then you can go actually get the blog post out as well and send that to whoever's asking you or just for your own, I guess, knowledge base as well there. So you can go give this a, a read. I'll link this in the YouTube description below, but I thought it was really, really great. I do want to just point out one thing here is that um, I think uh, people still get confused that they think this is kind of a, a sequential thing where like the merge happens first, then the surge happens, then the scourge. No, all of this is being built in parallel because of the fact that each roadmap section has different EIPs going live at different times. So it's all basically happening in parallel. It's not like we're just doing the merge related EIPs first, then the surge, then the scourge. And for example, the uh, one of the EIPs that's part of the surge is uh, is blobs, right? And scaling up uh, blobs. So we delivered that, but then the merge, uh, we've still got other things to and to essentially uh, go with that, such as um, a single slot finality and uh, potentially orbit single slot finality uh, and potentially like uh, staking related issuance reductions and, and, and sort of things like that there and, uh, and, 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 and faster block times, right? So as I said, these things happen in parallel. Just wanted to make that clear for people, but you can go give this a read. I'll, um, I'll link it in the YouTube description below for you to do so. 
All right, so speaking of the gas limits and what I had mentioned before about kind of being able to raise that and scale L1, um, Tomas from here from the Nethermind team put out a very simple tweet where he said, I support doubling the Ethereum mainnet gas target. Now I quote tweeted this and I said, historically I've been against upping the gas limit because I don't feel like it will have a material impact on L1 scalability and we already have L2s. A lot of things have changed over the last few months that have convinced me that we should increase the gas target slash limit even if it doesn't materially impact L1 scalability. Now, you guys know that I felt very strongly about this. I think like, I don't know how long ago it was now, but it was a few months ago that um, I don't think that raising the gas limit actually would uh, materially impact L1 scalability. I still don't think it would, to be honest, uh, but that's not the reason why I'm in favor of it now, uh, or at least that's not the main reason. The reason I'm, I'm in favor of it is more, I guess, like on the social side of things. And the, the main reason is that by scaling, by doubling the gas limit or like increasing the gas limit, essentially what we do is instead of talking about in the future sometime, you know, raising the gas limit or uh, scaling up L1, we essentially socially commit to doing it. And we basically say, okay, well, here's the social commitment, but then here's us who are actually raising the gas limit to prove that social commitment. Because now we're just socially committing, right? We're just saying, okay, we're going to do it. Well, cool. When? And then we say, oh, well, you know, when this, this, and this happens, it's like, that's all well and good. But what's more powerful than just saying it like it's not like no one believes us but what's powerful uh what's more powerful than just saying it is actually doing it to show that we're committed to doing it and you don't have to do it in a big way you don't have to double it like i'm, I'm not gonna say that we should double it from here but like we could do like a 10 percent incremental increase then another 10 percent then another 10 percent and that could show that we have a commitment to scaling not just the l2s but the l1 because scaling up the l1 actually scales the l2s as well not just with blobs we're scaling up the gas limit because that <clears throat> gives L1s better, uh, sorry, gives the L2s uh, better UX and potentially cheaper fees for things like uh, posting proofs down and stuff like that, right? But another big reason why it's uh, potentially okay to do this now is because we've had blobs live on the network for six months now, right? And the network's been chugging along just fine. We have a better understanding of how the network does with a bunch more load put on it. We don't need to essentially have this big unknown over our heads of like how blobs are gonna be utilized, what that's gonna look like, what the bandwidth is gonna look like on that. We know that now and we're gathering more data as time goes on. So we have more hard data to work with rather than just like stabbing in the dark. But in saying that, we're also doing a lot of work to reduce bandwidth consumption too. Like that's a big thing for the for um, the gas limit, but as, uh, as well as blobs is bandwidth consumption. Because as you guys know, there's been a lot of discussion recently about the fact that we actually do need to define some, I guess, minimum uh, bandwidth requirement for solo stakers, for people running full nodes at home. Because right now, I mean, there's not really any hard definition of this. And I discussed this on one of the previous refuels, there's essentially, well, what's the lowest kind of, uh, I guess, like powered uh, node on the network? Like who's got the le least bandwidth on the network? Um, and it's particularly upload bandwidth. And um, that becomes our floor. I, I don't think that should be the floor because essentially you're basically letting like a handful of people dictate the whole network in that in that sense. And th I'm not going to say they're dictating it like on purpose or anything, but what you're doing is it's just an arbitrary thing. You're just like looking at them and being like, oh, well, I don't want to kick them off the network, which we shouldn't want to do this. But at the same time, there is like a hard kind of discussion that needs to be had around having a minimum requirement here in order to keep scaling up the network. But in order to, I guess, like have an understanding around the fact that you know, we, we, we get that um, it, it's hard for people to get bandwidth, uh, get more bandwidth if it's just not available to them because it's not like hardware. You can't just go out and buy it. You have to rely on, um, on usually your government to, to kind of put in the infrastructure. Like here in Australia, there are suburbs that have fiber right to their house. And then there is a suburb, the next kind of suburb over, like a five minute drive, not even, that has copper still to, to their house, right? So the disparity and the, I guess, inequality when it comes to fiber optic connections and good internet generally, even in first world countries is huge. So I'm not gonna say that that's not an issue and that's not something that we have to take into consideration, but we just can't go on like this, I don't think. We can't just go on and be, and keep saying to ourselves, that's that's the flaw. No, we have to define a flaw in megabits per second for upload bandwidth specifically, and then we can work from there. I, I really don't think we should be doing it the way we're doing it right now. I think it's a big mistake, and I think it holds us back as a, as a network and as a community. But uh, on top of that as well, and the reason why I'm also in favor of a gas limit increase is because the clients have gotten a lot better and have got, they've gotten a lot more efficient. Like all of them have gotten so much better and more efficient over time, not just with their bandwidth usage, but just with their general stability and how they handle different things on the, on the network, how they handle 
um, uh, syncing through the network, how they handle uh, basically managing um, uh, storage space, uh, managing a bandwidth obviously is the big one there. So that to me is a perfect reason or another good reason why uh, that gas limit increase is actually justified here. And as I said, like this is Tomas from Nethermind, someone actually working on a client who said this. So when the client teams are saying this, um, not just one person, obviously you want like the majority of them to be saying this. I think that it's pretty safe to say that they're confident in what they've kind of built here and they're confident that raising the gas limit is not going to result in any kind of, I guess, like unintended or negative consequences uh, for the network here. Um, now also uh, what's really cool about raising the gas limit is that it's a very easy thing to do. Even though we have to consider everything that I just said, in terms of actually doing it, it's super easy. The validators just up, um, uh, just essentially vote up the gas limit themselves. It, and you say, okay, well, the gas limit is currently set to this. I'm gonna manually change my, um, my parameter in my config file. And I'm gonna say, I want the gas limit to be 40 million or 50 million or whatever uh, whatever you want it to be. And then the whole network can slowly do that and get up there, right? Traditionally, it's been done with the, I guess, like soft blessing of the core devs who are saying, okay, you guys doing this isn't gonna destroy the network, <laughs> which is which is pretty good, right? Um, but it doesn't require a hard fork. That's, that's the really cool thing about this because as you guys know, hard forks are pretty much like once a year at this point. So if we had to wait for a hard fork to increase the gas limit, We'd have to wait each year, and it would not. It, it would not be very obviously not very very fast. It would just be way too slow. But at the same time, we've actually gone longer than that since the last one. I think the last gas limit increase was like two or three years ago. So again, like we're justified again in increasing it because it's been so long. Hardware's obviously gotten better. Uh, bandwidth have gotten better. Uh, clients have gotten better. I understand that there are some people on the network that cannot get access to better upload bandwidth and we should make sure that we don't negatively affect them as much as possible but as i said before there needs to be a line drawn here there can't just be a put our finger up in the air and just like get a feeling for what uh, what we need to do here so that's my uh, my general take on that now there's also a tweet here from uh, vitalik that talks about uh, other things we can do, you know, not just increasing the gas limit, but like also the fact that we can reduce the gas costs of different EVM upcodes or pretty much every EVM upcode that's currently in the two to five range to one and in the six to two range to two. So that is a pretty huge uh, boost there as well. Uh, this requires a hard fork, of course. Uh, cut the gas, the gas cost of log by 4X, cut the gas cost of pre-compiles pre except the ones that we want to retire. So we can probably get a 1.5 TPS uh, increase without worsening any critical worst case numbers such as call data site and uh, size and io um but as i said this all requires a hard fork so like it's not something that's going to happen just because people want it to happen it needs to go through the governance process needs to go into the network um but it seems like that is actually being discussed at the core dev level as well so cool to see that there but yeah that's why essentially in a nutshell why i'm now in favor of increasing the gas limit i don't think we should like double it and like now like i don't think you know, every validator should right now just go and double their um, gas limit in their config that would be reckless, but I think we can gradually increase it. There was actually an effort, and this is the last time I spoke about this, what, what was an effort called Pump the Gas, and I think their website's still live, so pumpthegas.org, and you can actually see how this works in practice. They didn't want to double the gas limit. They essentially wanted to increase it from 30 million to 40 million, which is like a, what, a 33% increase. Um, and then essentially all you need to do, as you can see here, is in your uh, validator um, uh, client um, and on your execution client, you essentially increase your gas limit. So you go from 30 million to 40 million, you put the number in there, and they actually have the, the kind of... Um, the 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 um the lines here for you to copy paste they've also got a validator checker as well um and then it just increases as more people uh as more people kind of increase their their limit here as well uh you can go check this out it's still pr pretty relevant to today and i think this would be the better way to do it going in like maybe 10 million kind of increments here like 30 to 40, 40, 50, 50 to 60, rather than like doubling it straight away. And I think, you know, Tomas and other core devs would agree with this. It's a much better way to do it rather than just like yellowing and going double. And then over time, we obviously can increase it even more. And then once we have upgrades uh, like um, The Verge, for example, and we have other ways of, um, and then we have like better light clients, we have light, proper light client verification in the network, then we can increase it even more. And there's other things way down the line, like snarkifying the base layer and stuff like that too. So 
essentially uh, we should be doing a moderate gas limit here. So maybe I'll be pushing for it more. You might see me pushing for it more publicly because I obviously run validators and full nodes and all that. So I might change mine and then just push it for it publicly as well. But I want to see more core devs chime in on this. I want to see this discussed a bit more before I do that because I don't want to be reckless with it, of course. But it seems like it's closer than it has ever been, to be honest. And I think more people are on board with it now that we have a stable network with blobs and we have a lot of um, uh, improvements coming on, BAM on the bandwidth side and the clients have gotten a lot better over time as well. All right, so Rockapool has a massive upgrade that went live today called Saturn Zero. Now, Jasper has the thread you need to read on this, which I'll link in the YouTube description below. It is 42 tweets. So it is not a short thread, but essentially it will uh, give you a TLDR on not just Saturn Zero, but like everything that's happening with Rockapool. So he's calling this Rocketpool Reborn, which is a four-step process to Rocketpool uh, 2.0. So uh, Constellation L2 already went live. I spoke about this last week. This is XR ETH, which is the first full yield LST. Saturn Zero, um, which is ETH only bonds uh, that uh, essentially went live uh, today. So you can see this here in this tweet from, from Jasper. Saturn One, uh, which is Leb Fours. So basically four ETH mini pools plus direct value capture and a redesign. And Saturn Two, which is sublinear bonding down to 1.5 ETH plus an RPL buy and burn scheme. Now, of course, you can go read his thread for full explanation about all of this. I'm not going to try and TLDR it because because of the fact that you need to read the thread and I don't want to spoil the thread for you there. Um, but yeah, as I said, like Saturn Zero uh, went live here, which is a huge upgrade because you can now stake with just eight ETH. You don't need RPL anymore. That was probably the biggest blocker to Rockapool's growth over the last however many, I guess, months, maybe even years at this point that it's been. It has been, I think, the number one complaint from node operators that you needed RPL in order to spin up a mini pool. Uh, now you don't, which is obviously massive because it means that now more people can get involved Involved with staking, with setting up nodes as a Rockapool node operator because they don't have to go out and buy this other token. They can just bring their ETH, which is, I guess, the entire purpose of this upgrade, right? Just making it super easy make, uh, to scale up the Rockapool uh, ecosystem, the Rockapool node operator ecosystem here, uh, and remove any potential blockers, which is really, really great to see. So I've already got a bunch of uh, mini pools up and running, as you guys know. I have a bunch of RPL. Um, staked on them but unfortunately like the rpl price went down so much against eth that i'm like severely under collateralized but the nice thing is is that now if i want to spin up more mini pools i don't need any more rpl so i can just leave what i have there and then just bring eth which i may just do very shortly actually i do have some eth that's just lying there not staked right now and i was kind of thinking about what to do with it and then uh i i think that this might be something that i do in the near future spin up a bit uh, some some more mini pools here because i definitely want uh obviously my, my ETH to be staked and I want to keep supporting the Rockapool effort. So as I said, you can go give Jasper's tweet thread a read on everything got to do with Rockapool being reborn, not just this Saturn Zero upgrade. I'll link it in the YouTube description below for you to do so. All right, a big announcement out of Kraken over the last week. So they have introduced their Layer 2 called Ink. Now, of course, this Layer 2 is built on Ethereum. It has been a long time coming. I remember them teasing this quite a while ago, uh, and it's no surprise that they're building a Layer 2 considering the, the success that Base has had because Kraken is, I would say, like the number two US-based crypto exchange uh, in terms of uh, in terms of like market share in the US here. Uh, and the fact that they're doing their own L2 is, is a no-brainer, I think. Now, there are a bunch of details about this on their website or inkonchain.com. I actually really love the name, honestly, Ink. Like, it's such a cool name because as you can see from the branding, like, it lends itself to some really cool and unique branding. The purple is like the Kraken purple, so essentially it fits in with their overall branding scheme anyway. Um, and yeah, you can see, like, it just it just looks cool. Like, I love purple. Purple's actually my favorite color. Purple and orange, really. I mean, it's funny, but behind me is not really purple and orange, but in front of me, behind my... Um, my setup here, my um, my monitor and everything. There's orange there, there's purple there. Like, I just love it. It's just such a nice color scheme. And they've actually gone uh, towards more, the more degen side with Ink as well. Like, they're really trying to appeal to that more speculative side of crypto, those crypto natives who really want to 
just get on, do stuff on chain and, and do it fast and not have to pay high fees. So really, really cool to see this here. Now their test net's going live in less than two weeks and they are built, of course, on the super chain. I say, of course, because the OP stack is just dominating right now. Now, Yano from Blockworks did a podcast with the Inc. founder, uh, which you can go listen to them, uh, to that podcast. I think it's out soon on Empire on the um, the Empire podcast, but he TLDR'd uh, essentially what, um, what Kraken's thinking is around this new L2. So there was an eight months from decision to launch of, of Inc. So I think that's when they kind of first started teasing it. They're using Ethereum as their data availability layer. They obviously also looked at Celestia and Eigen, but they chose Ethereum, which is really cool because it just shows, again, that Ethereum DA has a premium on it, that's for sure, uh, and people want to use Ethereum DA. Uh, they're going to be exploring L3 DA, for a more modular, not just Ethereum. So they might just build L3s on, um, uh, uh, sorry, might build their LA, uh, DA with L3. Uh, could have more than one L2 in the distant future, not anytime soon. I don't know if that'll materialize. It doesn't really make sense to have more than one because it kind of shifts your focus. Maybe that was just an offhand comment that was made on the podcast. Uh, thought about building in-house, but used a roll-up as a service provider instead, which is Gelato. Uh, the goal is to get centralized order books on chain, which is a pretty pretty big goal, I think, and, and, and pretty doable with the current L2 um, infrastructure that we have. Um, the wallet is the portal. Uh, they thought about forking the OP stack, but are leveraging the interoperability of the super chain, which makes more sense, which actually, if you read between, not read, you don't have to read between the lines here. If you're paying attention, that means that ink and base will be able to interoperate with each other. That's cool. Like that is really cool. Like I can't wait for that to be a reality. Um, they didn't share revenue uh, split information, but that will be public soon. We'll lean into dev tooling ahead of mainnet. There's a thousand plus people at Kraken that are in the ink Slack channels. This is obviously something that's exciting them. Like it's exciting exciting me. Uh, they, hundreds of L2s are launching in the next several months. So that's more of, I guess, like not just about ink, but just the general trend that we're seeing right now. Uh, it's very obvious that every app will have its own chain. I completely agree with that, honestly. Um, and those chains will be within the respective super chains, whether that's on OP stack or somewhere else. Uh, they launched uh, with with base support, which is very cool. Um, they're going to uh, uh, launch a token for Inc. If it wasn't for the regulators, we know that base would do the same thing. Like if it wasn't for the regulators, if we had like an SEC that wasn't run by Gary Gensler, uh, base would have probably already had a token, to be honest. And Inc. would definitely have a token as well because a token gives you just so much to work with, right? Um, the board members and investors like the idea, doesn't think it will hurt their future IPO prospects. And an unofficial vision is to have every PRD at Kraken have an on-chain component to it. So essentially every product at Kraken have an on-chain component to it. So I guess this is Kraken going head to head with base, honestly, like th that's what the comparison is. That's what the comp is here. And, but as I said, like base and ink are going to be interoperable with each other. They're going to be able to talk to each other. There is not going to be a walled garden here. So really it's going to be interesting to see like what each of these businesses do to drive customers to their L2. Obviously Coinbase is further ahead because base has been live for a while. They already have more downstream products like their Coinbase wallet. But I think Kraken's stands a real chance to compete here, especially if they appeal uh, from the from the very start to the more DGEN crowd, because that's, uh, or I guess like the more DGEN on-chain native crowd, uh, and especially leverage their unique branding here with Inc. in order to in, in, in order to um, uh, get people on chain. So just super exciting, guys. And I think what I agree with most on these podcast notes is that that the fact that there's going to be hundreds of L2s launching in the next several months and that every app will have its own chain because launching a chain has become as easy as kind of just deploying a smart contract at this point. And if you can launch a chain and the infrastructure costs come down, because it's not just launching the chain, it's also paying for like an Etherscan implementation of your chain. It's also paying RPC providers, all that sorts of stuff, right? But if all of that collapses down to, I wouldn't say zero, but like very, very low, and it becomes so cheap to launch your own chain, and then you can internalize a lot of your revenues and you can get the security of Ethereum, you can leverage Ethereum for your consensus, your security, your DA, everything like that. Like, why wouldn't you do it? And that's the vision, right? That really is the Ethereum vision. And I think that's what we're going to see. And that really is the bull case for the modular future. That is the bull case for Ethereum is that you're going to have all these chains that are just going to default launch on Ethereum because where else are you going to go? Like, where else is as reliable and as secure as Ethereum L1? Where, Which other L1 is actually being built for this? There are some out there, but they're very small. I think Tezos is being built to be L2 friendly, but they're more focused on like the enshrined roll-up. 
roll-ups, which is a noble pursuit, but I think in shrine roll-ups uh, 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 can be limited in several ways. Uh, but in terms of like building for L2s specifically, then there's nowhere else, really. It's just Ethereum. Now, of course, you can build these on other networks because the other networks are permissionless as well if they allow for it. But if they're not specialized for it, if they're not focused on that, if the culture around their, their chain is not built for that, then I don't think they're going to get much traction there. I don't think they're going to get much market share there. Whereas Ethereum is specifically built for this. And we are going to keep pushing the frontier here uh, on this with blobs and with other improvements to L1 in order to scale up the L2s. Uh, and it really is a no-brainer because as I said before, or as Vitalik said, Ethereum has never gone offline. Ethereum has been online the whole time. It is incredibly secure. It has $100 billion worth of economic security in each stake behind it. It has tens of thousands of nodes distributed across the planet. It is just so secure, so reliable right now that there's nowhere else to launch. So that is really kind of a really, uh, I guess, like big bull case for Ethereum uh, going forward there. All right, so Peter here, who is uh, doing marketing at Circle, the issuers of USDC, has been putting out a lot of these tweets lately about the fact that uh, Base has been doing record numbers when it comes to USDC stablecoin transfers. Now, you can see in this chart what Base looks like. Uh, this is on a uh, day. So this is October 26. Base processed $18.1 billion worth of uh, USDC stablecoin transfers here, which is more than any other chain. You can see here all the other chains listed uh, as well it's more than any other chain, any other L1 or L2. Now, you'll remember back to when I said that Base had a, a, a Circle and Coinbase had a huge opportunity with Base to become like the de facto USDC payments layer. And it was a no-brainer for them to do that considering that they're, they're, they're ones heavily invested in USDC and also Base. And well, that's exactly what they've done here. So this is no surprise to me that this has happened because essentially a lot of USDC transactions are free or near free on the network. This transfer volume reflects that. Uh, and I I actually DM'd Peter and he's gonna look into this for me about uh, what is actually happening with this. Like who's using this? Like why is there so much uh, USDC stablecoin transfers happening on base right now? Because whenever I see stuff like this, especially on like really cheap chains, I take it with a grain of salt because uh, as you guys know, I've, I've talked about this before. If a chain is like basically free to use, there's nothing stopping people from just like wash trading or bots from like faking the metrics. Now I'm not accusing Coinbase or Circle, anyone involved with them as of doing this, but like someone else could be doing it or there could be some other reason for this activity that we just don't know yet. So I like the headline number, don't get me wrong, it's great and it's great to see this growth. But what I really wanna see is like a deeper analysis on this, see what's actually happening here. Is there real people using this for like purchases? Were people using it within DeFi? What are people using this for? Because it's like the headline number itself is kind of cool, but as I said, like it's not gonna tell us much right now. So yeah. I'm I'm looking forward to hearing back there and I'll let you guys know um, how that goes there. Now, speaking of base, they announced something huge over the, I guess, like weekend or I guess, no, this is a few days ago now. So fault proofs or fraud proofs are coming to base mainnet on October 30th, which is in two days from now. This means anyone can monitor and permissionlessly challenge invalid withdrawals, removing the need for a trusted third party. The base team has been collaborating closely with Optimism to bring fault proofs to base and ensure a safe upgrade. This, I believe, brings base over to stage one on L2 Beat. So if you go to L2Beat, Dot com today and I'll bring up the website for you guys to see here you can see that base is at stage zero still even though it is the number two l2 and arbitrum one is at stage one it's like sandwiched between two stage ones op main is stage one because it has fault proofs but once uh base implements them i believe they go to stage one i believe they do uh which is a pretty big upgrade because everyone keeps telling me that base is never going to decentralize and yet they're moving closer to decentralization by the day and i just can't wait until we have uh arbitrum one uh and base especially because they're, they're one and two at stage two because then that could be the day we say well look hey the l2s are decentralized there goes that FUD. I'm sure there's going to be some other FUD, but like there goes that FUD. We can we can do away with that. Uh, and I obviously want to see the other L2s move towards stage one and stage two as well. But the, having the biggest ones there just sets an example for the rest of the ecosystem, which I think is very important. So yeah, looking forward to October 30th year and uh, for base to reach stage one of the roll-up journey. 
All right, finally here, this is what I mentioned before, uh, DevCon. So DevCon is coming up very, very soon, guys. It is in like a couple of weeks. I'll be leaving here to go on the 9th of November. So from the 9th of November till, wait, the 9th is a Saturday. So I guess like from the 8th of November until the, let me have a look here, till the 18th of November, there will be no refuels. So essentially 10 days without refuels because I will be at DevCon. Now, DevCon is shaping up to be the biggest, uh, I guess, like or one of the biggest Ethereum conferences ever, definitely the biggest DevCon ever. So 12,000 plus people are expected to show up. That's an enormous amount of people, guys. I think the only other conference that had that many people was Dev, uh, uh, ETH Denver. So uh, yeah, biggest DevCon yet. 900 plus volunteers have signed up, 300 plus volunteers have been selected, and the venue is twice the size of the venue in Bogota. Now, I didn't go to Bogota, but I heard it was a really great time. I heard it was a nice venue. And the venue in Bangkok, I believe, is relatively new. So it should be a world-class venue. And I'm very much looking forward to going because this will be my only major Ethereum conference of the year. Very much looking forward to meeting as many of you as possible that I haven't met before and just catching up with old friends as well. I will be busy. Like my calendar is filling up very, very quickly, but I will make it a point to be at the actual conference, like when the conference days are on. And then of course, there is the Bankless Summit on the 16th of of November, uh, which is just the day after the DevCon finishes. And that's where I'll be doing my my talk at, at, as well. But I'll be there pretty much like the whole day. So I'm, I'm hoping to see a lot of you guys there as well. I believe there are still some tickets for sale. You can probably <clears throat> find a link to that if you just Google Bankless Summit. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to give you guys a heads up that that is coming up shortly. And I'll be out um, of action on the refuel uh, for that period of time. But hey, if you find me at, uh, at DevCon, uh, you're probably just going to get like a refuel because you can ask me as many questions as you want and I'll just answer them. That's what people usually do. Like I meet up with people, we have a little bit of a chat and then they just start asking me Ethereum questions and I'm like, yes, give me more Ethereum questions. I want to answer them. I want to teach you guys. Like that's just what I love doing. Like it's kind of funny how my my, my calling in life seems to be an educator. It doesn't matter what it is. Like I, I I don't just know stuff about Ethereum. I know stuff about a lot of other things. Um, and whenever people ask me questions of stuff that I know about, <clears throat> I get like super excited having uh, being able to answer them and being able to like watch their faces as they, uh, as they basically understand understand what I'm saying and <clears throat> And learn from me. But obviously, I know a lot about Ethereum. So that's where kind of my, my home base is. So yeah, don't be shy to come up to me, ask me questions about anything you want, and just have a chat. Very much looking forward to all of you uh, there. But anyway, I think on that though, that's going to be it for today. So thank everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all uh, next time. <laughs>